I'm reminded of, of uh, in uh, My Fair Lady, Eliza Doolittle says, uh, sings a song, you know, words, 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 I'm so sick of words. And we have to do a little bit of that, but we're going to end up with some pictures which tell the story. And certainly what we can see on satellite imagery today really helps do that. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the invitation to talk with you this afternoon as it really has given me uh, the opportunity to, to, to really remember a special time in my family's life because we spent a fair amount of time here uh, beginning in 72 through 75 and off and on since then. So when the Conservancy asked me to place this discussion in a historical context, Kiowa as it was, I puzzled on how to do that for this audience. Um, after all, Kiowa Conservancy has produced some wonderful reports and, and the documents that contain a great deal of information on the contemporary history and uh, a great deal of, of current environment on Kiowa. But let me tell you today uh, some of the history of Kiowa as it was shaped by the South Carolina of the 1970s. And it was a very different time in this place. Let's consider the point at which the development of Kiowa started so we can better understand how we got to today and where that might lead us in the future. In the late 1960s and early 70s, a series of events, some of which are not usually linked, were put in motion. In 1970, BASF announced that they were going to put a very large petrochemical plant in Beaufort County on the Colleton River just above Hilton Head Island which was just emerging as a destination resort. This led to the initiation of an environmental movement in South Carolina, objecting to the proposal. The environmentalists worked with the shrimpers and crabbers and development community of Hilton Head, and the project was withdrawn. Now that's the short version of that story. <laughs> in 1970, the owners of the old rice fields on the South Carolina coast introduced legislation in the General Assembly to give them title to tidally inundated wetlands, the old rice fields. This increased the environmental activism of the people of South Carolina. The rice field ownership bill became transformed in the legislature. With the leadership of Representative Bill Campbell, who has been mentioned earlier, and in the House, and Alex Sanders in the Senate, coastal zone management legislation ultimately emerged. There was a new generation of legislators committed to acting as true stewards of the natural resources of South Carolina, held in trust for the people of South Carolina, and they were willing to engage with the scientific community and base legislation on the best available science to develop public policy. By 1970, the University of South Carolina had recruited a critical number of of researchers in estuarine and coastal ecology at the newly created Brook Institute and the Department of Geological Sciences had a similar group of extremely excellent coastal geologists. Our neighbors in Georgia and North Carolina were also assembling faculty expertise in these disciplines. And the Southeast, these three states became leaders nationally and internationally in the sciences of estuaries and coastal oceans. Thus, there was technical expertise to conduct fundamental ecological research, environmental research, and analyze the physical and ecological process of the coastal zone. Uh, John Bernberg and I came to the University of South Carolina in 1970 to establish the Brute Institute and the Marine Science Program. And in those early years, I used Ian McCarg's 1969 book, Design with Nature, as the reading for a seminar because it was transforming many fields. McCarg took the fundamental concepts and terminology of ecology and restated them in a language that architects and planners could understand and apply at multiple scales. They could range from a small house and garden to large planned communities and the Kiowa. 
By 1974, the Kuwait Investment Company completed their purchase of Kiowa. They chose it because it was a large, undeveloped barrier island, and they could develop it as the sole owner, unlike any other large island for coastal development. With that understanding and opportunity, they initiated several actions that led to the development of Kiowa as we know it today. In 1973, Bill Campbell and Alex Sanders and I formed a small company, the Environmental Research Center, to provide environmental information to developers, governmental and private interests, and nonprofit organizations. ERC was asked by Coastal Shores, the U.S. corporation of the Kuwait Investment Company, to develop a comprehensive inventory of the natural assets of the island. The outcome of that effort was the Environmental Inventory of Kiowa Island, the document reviewed by the Conservancy and led to this gathering. And by the, the, the choice of the term environmental inventory was very, very carefully done. We did not call it an assessment. And that can come up later. Uh, ERC, <clears throat> ERC was strictly advisory to Coastal Shores, and Coastal Shores set the policies and practices for sea pines, and they it, and ERC did not advocate any particular outcome. In 1974, there were very few regulations relative to uh, development on coastal islands. The South Carolina courts had determined that the lands, you know, now pay attention because we're going to have a little quiz on this later on, <laughs> the lands below the mean, geometric mean high tide with a geometric mean of the, let me start over. <laughs> the lands below the 17 year moving geometric mean of the high tide line. That was the critical point. And who knows where that is? <laughs> because well, it's a moving geometric mean. By definition, it's gonna be moving, right? And that, come, that becomes very important as you move forward in this kind of discussion. Uh, those lands were held in trust for the state of South Carolina citizens, and you were not supposed to impact the dunes. There was no requirement for such a thing as an environmental impact statement. And by the way, I think it's true that that's a term that was coined by Ian McCarver. Now, if you consider the economic climate of that time, I personally think that it took courage and vision for the Kuwait Investment Company to initiate such a study. They then held Sea Pines, easily the most visionary and sensitive development company at that time, and perhaps since, to most of the recommendations in the report. The Kuwaitis demanded far more than was required, and they have probably not received enough credit for what they did. They operated at a very high standard of what was supported with good data and analysis, and what was the right thing to do. I suspect that the Kiowa today stands by itself as a model of coastal resort residential development. If they had done otherwise, you would not see the island as it is in its present state. In 1974, the foredoon was the limit to building close to the beach. It was well understood that seawalls increase local erosion, as do uh, jetties and groins and they decreased the available public beach. History, bitter experience of science showed us that you need to protect the dune field vegetation, you know, the wax fertile thicket behind the poor dune, as well as the vegetation on the dune. Healthy dune fields are the basis for a healthy beach, the basic resource for tourism and coastal recreation, and a resource held in trust for the people of South Carolina. <coughs> Wetlands in the coastal zone need protection as they are the basis for the biological and economic productivity of the recreational and commercial fisheries of these areas. If you want shrimp, fish, crabs, oysters for your table and for the restaurants that you frequent and it supports tourism, you must protect the coastal wetlands. Because of this alignment of political, economic, social, and scientific elements, 
the Coastal Zone Management Act was passed and signed into law in 1977. The act called for the creation of the South Carolina Coastal Council and the development of the initial regulations under which South Carolina operated for the next 10 years. Over time, it became clear, though, that the existing regulations were not adequate for the complex issues facing the coastal zone. The legislature created a Blue Ribbon Committee on Beachfront Management. It was charged with making comprehensive recommendations for the future management of the coast. That 1987 report led to the Beachfront Management Act of 1988. The report was groundbreaking in that the recommendations developed by consensus were based upon fundamental scientific information on the physical and ecological processes of the coast. I want to emphasize that the intimate understanding of the members of that Blue Ribbon Committee, what they had for the coast, most had a personal and professional relationship with the coast. They were not all of one political or, or economic persuasion, nor did they have the same set of cultural or social values. As a body, they met in venues from the northern to the southern coast. They walked the beaches and flew the coast. They met and had demonstrations of different technologies, saw different types of residential, community, and recreational development, had lectures and workshops with scientists and engineers, and they argued and argued and argued. And I, I was on that. <laughs> now, what they always worked toward what would be in the best interest of the people of South Carolina. And as far as the science of the coast goes, they were not ignorant, 1970 through 87. They had access to excellent information on the dynamics of the coast, which was presented to the committee, and used that information for the development of policies and recommendations for legislators. The report is revealing, as it is obvious, that in recent years, the political, the political leadership of this state has gone in the opposite direction from what was clear to that committee and the legislature at that time. If you look at the final regulations that were adopted in 88 and 89, you would find that those policies and their implementation were already in place at Kiowa. What decisions and policies are best for the South Carolina coast? You must accept the fact that ecosystems follow the fundamental laws of physics. Newton's laws work. Gravity is real. Nature is dynamic, and people have known that, but not necessarily respected it. The currency of nature <coughs> calories from the sun. Mother Nature has more capital than all the DPs <coughs> of the world combined many times over. If you don't understand that, you're in trouble. Over time, no matter how many words marketers write or legislators <coughs> and regulations are created by politicians or what lawyers justify in litigation or public and private interests spend in billions of dollars in techno fixes with seawalls, groins, jetties, and beach nourishment projects, Mother Nature will prevail. 